2 of my Easter Sermon. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requirement of repentance, baptism without church discipline, and communion without confession. Cheap grace is the grace without di discipline, ship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap jacks wares. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace is represented at the church's inexhaustible treasury from which she showers blessings in generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price, grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance, and because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Since the cost was infinite, the possibilities of using and spending it are infinite. What would grace be if it were not cheap? Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, and communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nests, nets and follows him. Costly grace is a gospel which must be sought each again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and is a grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and the grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of the Son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God must cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is the grace because... God did not reckon his son to you, dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. Our walks with God are lifelong, and it is very narrow and straight path we must walk. Being of Christ, we as Christians are of costly grace. For following Christ metaphorically and literally costs a person their physical life slash earthly life. Everyone sins, this is a fact. We must bring our sins to God on the daily and ask not only forgiveness, but the forgiveness slash intercession for others. If we do not, unrepentant sins do stack up, especially in the final judgment. Those who are taught the false doctrine, once saved, always saved, are taught not to bring their sins to God, especially daily, and that is why they fall, and most if not all of them, those are the same type of persons that ended up being beings of hatred, or worse. God, out of love, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Not only are we to believe in Jesus, of whom is our intermediary to God, but we are to follow his teachings, which is to be of peace and to be of love, to have compassion, empathy, sympathy for others, and to love our neighbors everyone around us, as ourselves, and to love our enemies, those who would do harm to us. We are to be never we are to never be of hate. If we are, we aren't of Christ and therefore aren't Christians and should not be counted as such. Thus the winnowing is necessary to cleave those who aren't of God, those who are of hate, racism, xenophobia, from those who are of God, those who are of love, who are compassionate and caring for others, those who have empathy and sympathy for others, including those who are less fortunate, the destitute, and the immigrant. The thing is with society, many people, especially those who spouse to be Christian and doing nothing of the sort that we Christians are commanded to do, like those who supported Trump and continue to do so, or the like-minded persons for that matter, fail to see Christ around them, and their eyes are blind to seeing him and understanding in no uncertain terms how they treat people, especially the less fortunate or in the immigrant. God is, in fact, watching them, 
and their continued actions are dooming them to Gehenna, and they don't realize it. They make these willful choices regardless of their indoctrination. Again, I don't want to be part of the winnowing, but I am obedient to God alone. I accept the winnowing as necessary, though unfortunate. God is in control and God is moving. There are many things that are going to happen. Things will only continue to get worse until America repents from his cardinal sins, such as idolatry concerning Trump and his supporters, as well as the beings of hatred continuing to be subsumed by their hate, rage, acting on it, and continually being utilized by Lucifer, for as I've pr proven, he uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils in their acts. So, like January 6th events, and especially the stuff that's happening right, well, on Friday for that matter, for that matter. <sighs> Good Friday at the Capitol. <clears throat> they, as well as all of us, have to let go of our own bigotry and hatreds and willfully choose to be of love and act in love and peace, not hatred and violence no matter what. It is commanded that we are of love. I have to let those I claim to be of Christ but fails tenets and te testaments to go to their uncertain fates. Though I'll still pray for them though. I am of love and prayer is love because prayer is intercession through Jesus to God. But I as a legally ordained reverend officially and spiritually acknowledge they aren't of Christ and subsequently not an actual Christian, officially or otherwise. According to the Bible and theology, they aren't, and to treat them as such until they repent and atone, that they can't be forgiveness without repentance. God will fix them, heal them according to his will, and therefore out of love we pray for their healing and repentance and atonement, in which God will forgive them. Unlike them, a true Christian must always help others, especially the less fortunate. This does include the immigrant, FYI and be forgiving even when we desire not to. Jesus stands at the door knocking, Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. In total reality, he comes in the form of the beggar, of the dissolute human child in ragged clothes asking for help. He confronts you and every person that you meet. As long as there are people, Christ will walk the earth as your neighbor, as the one through whom God calls you and speaks to you, makes demands of you. This is the great seriousness and great blessedness of the Advent message. Christ is standing at the door. He lives in the form of a human being among us. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, God is in the Manger. Here is another good quote. And in the incarnation, the whole human race recovers the dignity of the image of God. Henceforth, any attack, even on the least of men, is an attack on Christ, who took the form of man, and in his own person restored the image of God in all the bears a human form. Through fellowship and communion with the Incarnate Lord, we recover our true humanity, and at the same time we are delivered from that individualism, which is a consequence of sin, and retrieve our solidarity with the whole human race. By being partakers of Christ Incarnate, we are partakers of the whole humanity which he bore. We now know that we have been taken up and born in the humanity of Jesus, and therefore, the new nature we now enjoy means we too must bear the sins and sorrows of others. The incarnate Lord makes his followers the brothers of all mankind, and that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. So, in closing, we as Christians are commanded to follow Christ's teachings and testaments, to be of peace and to be of love, and to be not of hate no matter what. We are to forgive others, especially, regardless of who we desire to or not. That is also love. There is hope, though, through Christ Jesus. On Easter, in which we celebrate, Jesus rose from the dead and became Christ incarnate, the Savior of us all. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, that should whoever believe in him not perish but have eternal life. I will be closing with some Easter prayers. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. And that's from the Book of Common Prayer, 1979 version, Protestant Episcopal Church. And here is another prayer. Lord, we lift our hearts to you. As the dawn breaks, may we carry the unity we share into every moment, knowing that we are one with the risen Christ. Lord, we lift our eyes to you. As the sun rises, may this moment stay with us, reminding us to look for the beautiful colors of promise in your word. Lord, we lift our prayers to you. As the dew air falls, may we breathe this morning in and know that, like the earth, you sustain us, keep us, and work within us always. And so we lift our voices to you. We celebrate the greatest day in history when Jesus rose from death, defeated darkness, and bathed the world in stunning resurrection light. May we ever live to praise you. Amen. Anyways, everyone, stay safe, have a good Easter, and God bless.